skills. Yeah. What's the next step for them? How do we get that child to next step? How do we get the child to think that that's the next step and make it aware on them and motivate them? I would entirely agree. Yeah. But what I'm trying to get at is mm. why do you think sort of instinctively, it seems to me, viscerally, mm. that the idea of putting children into groups, either within a classroom or between classes, yeah. is itself so detrimental to them? I mean, do you not think that perhaps... As a society, yeah. we all overreacted so much to the whole business of IQ at 11 plus mm. that we have thrown out the baby with the bathwater and that we don't accept that actually children benefit from being taught agreed. in groups according to their levels so that they can reach their own potential. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. Working in groups, but these groups don't have to be predetermined by the teacher. These groups don't have to be predetermined by a narrow system of measurement that's highly quantifiable and highly measurable. Why can't the make a judgment? That's what, well, the, well, I'll tell you what we do at Roxham. So the, the child will make that choice on their level of challenge, OK? Challenge Why should one. the child make the choice? Because they are the learner. They, they, they're teaching. The te if, if a child is making the wrong choice, I will step in and help that child make the choice for them. So I'll say, OK, for you know instance, I mean? child... The child's the adult. No, not at all. The child is part, the child is part of a learning journey that we're all on together as learning a class. Journey. This all sounds very fluffy, very woolly. It but is fluffy, Come to my school. Melanie, Melanie. Uh, come me, to my no, school no, and speak to the children no, and you will see... There you are. You've you got will no, see how you've articulate got no, no, they are. <laughs> In their ability to You've talk no about open their invitation. learning Ma and what they're going to do to Ma progress and Michael, take them to the next level. Michael Portillo. Do come, do, do come. Uh, Dr Plowman, who's one yes. of the two scientists that we're talking about, says that 52% of the variation in GCSE results is due to genetics. Mm. From your experience as a teacher, do you find that plausible or implausible? From looking at the study and, and uh, the bits I have looked at... Um, it's, it also says that there's a huge factor in, in, in the environment the child's in as well, the school, the family, etc. So it's not just this is the only determining factor. No, 52%. 52%, so just over half. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to understand, really, <laughs> without becoming a genetic physicist myself or a genetic uh, sorry, scientist myself. Um, well, the way you'd understand it is you, you would observe yeah. that you, know, you, you, you make a lot of effort with um, a set of children. Mm. Um, some of them will respond perhaps better than others. Mm. But you might observe, if, if the evidence from Dr Plowman is right, that actually in some cases, for all the efforts that you've made, mm. still the bigger part of their outcome has been determined by what they started with rather than the interventions that have been made since. It is quite striking. Um, Does that mean that's, that's plausible? I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to sit down and have a, a big conversation with some people and find out. Cause Not implausible. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. All no, I'm okay. saying is that we need to be very, very uh, aware and concerned about the unintended consequences that we bring into schools to try and right. raise standards. We will all agree that we want every child to reach their full potential, to become a successful part of British society, yes. to input into the economy. I completely share those sentiments entirely, which is why I became a teacher. However, I also see firsthand through speaking to children how the unintended consequences of setting viability, the unintended consequences of bringing in systems of measurement to try to boost standards actually can sometimes have a counterproductive effect Let's on a child and their well-being and their notions themselves as a learner. Let's talk about intended consequences. Yes. You want to iron out differences. You want to give everybody the same sort of opportunity. You want to lift people together. I take it that's the point of your school. But would you not be aided in that mm. by having scientific knowledge? If you knew about the genetic makeup of a pupil, would that not help you to make the correct intervention for that pupil? I would welcome anything. Personally, as a teacher, I would welcome any information that would give me a wider picture of that child and, 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 and be that their cognitive... Um, working levels at that moment in time for them, um, be it their aptitude to, to calculate number yeah. uh, or, or to synthesise text or to write coherently. I'd welcome any information that can give me a bigger picture of that child. However, we don't just look at the child in very narrow, limited views, which a lot of schools do. Um, we yeah. try to understand the child's wider no, needs you, and family needs. You, and you, and you would want to understand yes. the child, the background. Yeah. You'd want to uh, consider the child yourself. But if someone could give you the evidence about where they started genetically, that could be a useful addition to the way that you could help that child? As I said, I would welcome any information that would give me a wider picture. However, I'd, I'd be very concerned of having a predetermined opinion on that child's abil ability. I'm going to use that word by looking at that. So I, I would shy from it for a while, get to know the children on a working level as their teacher, create a culture in the class where it's all about self-challenge, um, where we, we, uh, we appreciate and we celebrate children who uh, take the ownership and, and, and really uh, seek to, to strive highly. And we do have high results. We have um, 
just under th a third of our children have level six writing last year in SATs. Our SATs results are highly above the national average. However, we don't see SATs as like a finite indicator of a child's potential. We see it as part of a system of measurement, part of a system of understanding the child so we can give them the best education possible. Steve Davey, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is Dr Anders uh, Sandberg, who's research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at uh, Oxford University. Is it immoral to use the science of genetics for human enhancement or immoral not to use that science? I think it can be immoral not to use it. It's nice and clear. Giles? Um, explain this business of transhumanism that you're into. Well, I've been interested in the idea of enhancing humans. Uh, after all, people had for a long time wanted to live longer, be smarter, be happier, etc. And some technologies might help us do that. And that, of course, raises interesting questions, both about can we do it, what will it cost, and, of course, is it a good idea? Do you dream of perfect human beings? I don't think there is such a thing. But, I mean, the, the part... Of the back of this idea, there's some idea of what you're striving towards. Is it what it, body by Versace, mind by Einstein? Is that the sort of thing? Well, if everybody wore Versace uh, clothing, people wouldn't want to wear it because they would be too ident identical. There are certain uh, goods that we might all want. We might all want to be smarter, but we might want to be creative in different ways. We might want to use language in different ways and so on. I think we don't want to age very fast, but certainly some people will think that, yeah, eventually I might want to give up. But whether that is after 80 years or 800 years might be very different. But there is something about perfection within, within this idea of striving towards something. I think we're striving in a lot of very different directions. We have a lot of the things we're striving away from. We don't want sickness, we don't want death, we don't want stupidity. But on the other hand, what kind of extended life you want might be very, very you different. You see, some of the... Th here's the thing. Here's the thing that gets me. Some of, the pro some of the things like death, you say we don't want death. But actually, there's some of the virtues that we might have that are not possible without death. OK, why is it, for instance, that uh, in Greek literature all the gods fall in love with mortal human beings? I think it's actually... So, so many... It happens all the time, you know, in Odysseus and so forth, because we can manifest things like courage, that if you're immortal you can't manifest courage. You don't think some of the Greek gods are showing courage? When Zeus overthrew Kronos, I think he was it, pretty it, courageous. If I walk through a minefield and I'm immortal, I'm not demonstrating courage by walking through the minefield. I'm not. I'm not going to get blown up. It doesn't. If I am mortal and I walk through the minefield, I am demonstrating courage. It is our limits that actually give us what it is that's beautiful about being human. And you want to just erode those limits. Well, if we remove those limits, we're always going to have other limits. The laws of physics are pretty nasty. We can't get around them. And no doubt what kind of society we set up, we're going to find that there are some things we simply can't have anyway. But this business about transhuman, this is beyond the human. There's a sort of... My worry is there's a hatred of the idea of humanity and our imperfections in what makes us lovable and wonderful and great. And you want to iron these out in this search I, for something? I disagree. I don't want to iron out the imperfections. Some of them are quite uh, nice. It's just that some of them are very problematic. Cruelty. We should probably get rid of that, although it's part of our nature. If we got rid of cruelty, we would be something beyond human. But I think we would all agree that's a pretty good choice. And you can get rid of... Cruelty in a test tube, you think? I'm not certain. They seem to be a fairly basic thing in the mammalian limbic system that might actually one day be possible to you know, change. Well, I think this is the most... I mean, it's mad. I mean, I have to say, it just seems entirely mad. But um, it, 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 it seems crazy to think that you can just, just wipe it all away with a bit of science. I don't think it's going to be that simple. It's going to be a long way. And uh, quite a lot of our early promising results in genetics typically end up finding, oh, it wasn't that simple. Similar with a lot of other technologies, we have a lot of wonderful gadgets and we're discovering, oh, it wasn't quite that simple. And I think this is going to be true for the transhumans too. We're going to discover, wow, we got rid of ageing. Hmm, we have another interesting problem now, or we have several in the problems to deal with. Fine, but I rather have those problems. Melanie Phillips? You say you don't want, we don't want stupidity. Isn't that dangerously close to saying that we as a human race don't want stupid people? It's slightly complicated because we voluntarily become stupid by going to the pub and drinking too much. We, what we generally want is 
We want to avoid the bad effects of stupidity. We want to avoid those small mistakes or the big mistakes that cost us a lot of things. I think the kind of everyday the mishaps, I think we're pretty okay with but, them. But you want to eradicate stupidity. You want to manipulate uh, the uh, genetic structure so that we get rid of stupid people, what, in utero? Uh, I think uh, we're not going to have it that is easy because w- if, there's like one thing like I, if there's one thing I learned in Oxford is that very clever people do amazingly stupid things all the time. Right. So intelligence is not a cure for stupidity. There, there are probably no real cure for stupidity, but we can try to reduce it. We can try to get rid of various forms. Of- How? Some of it might indeed be genetic, but I think a lot of other is education. We're going to need to figure out contexts that prevent us from doing dangerously stupid things. Okay, so I I was going to ask you what you think education is for. I think part of it is to grow as a person so you can become autonomous and work in society and then also get the advantage of help help from other people. Mm -hmm. Some of it is getting knowledge, but also developing your own skills in thinking. Okay, but what do we do with the people who will remain stupid? There are people who are, I mean, let's put it another way. By what criteria do you purport to say that some people are stupid? I mean, someone might think you're stupid. Oh, yes. I mean, it's, Indeed, it, it, it's entirely I, subjective, and aren't you proposing something that's really dangerous, that it's a subjective judgment about human beings here? I'm generally not uh, trying to attack stupidity itself, because it's too weird and a big uh, concept. But think about cognitive biases that make us unable to make rational decisions. For example, we tend to underestimate certain risk. That's an inherent part of how brain works, and it, we would be better off as a species and as individuals if we had less yes, of that. But you are a transhuman uh, supporter. You don't just believe in educating people to their potential so that they we reduce the amount of stupid actions that people take. You believe in altering what it is to be a human being so there are fewer stupid people around and fewer people with other characteristics that you, in your secular, God-given right to determine what should well, be right, yeah, but I don't think, think I'm, I have a right to decide for you. I think people well, should have nice. a right to decide for themselves. And I think we're also going to find people having disagreement about even what stupid is and might be going in very different directions. Dr Sandberg, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Um, our next witness is uh, uh, Dr. David King. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. David King, who's a genet- geneticist himself and is founder and director of Human Genetics Alert. Um, uh, all this stuff is, from your point of view, dangerous and immoral, isn't it? How so? Yeah, yeah, pretty much so. I mean, I think the history of eugenics, uh, you know, shows us where where this is going. And I, I thought it was rather interesting in the earlier discussion that it, the discussion was framed in terms of, oh, well, scientists just want to, pr- you know, provide the knowledge, and then it's nasty politicians who who twist what they do. The whole history of eugenics is about scientists with political agendas, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, what we see, what we see with this this research that is being promoted now, is is part of that that long history. Okay, let me hand you over to a former nasty politician, <laughs> Um If 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 in due course we continue to discover uh, genetic predispositions that would make it more likely that we get, say, heart disease, is it wrong then to use that information to make interventions to make it less likely for the most susceptible people actually to develop heart disease? Oh, of course not. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a molecular biologist. I don't have a, the slightest problem in using genetics for, for responsible purposes. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, the history of eugenics is its use for highly irresponsible persons. And in this case, you know, an but, association but, but, of, of a field of genetics that is, that is literally with extremely a right-wing and racist politics. But that, but that is precisely a prejudice, isn't it? You have made a prejudgment based on your understanding of history about how this knowledge might be used in the future. Uh, indeed, I have, and I, you know, I think uh, if you actually, you know, I'm not, I'm not pulling facts, you know, out of the air. We, there, there, there are very solid facts that show the continuation, actually, of uh, of the eugenic uh, research agenda throughout the 20th century. And actually, I don't want to kind of make a ad hominem attack on Robert Plomin, but he's very, he's very important in this field, and he has. You know, he has very dirty hands, basically. He has. Sounds pretty uh, ad hominem. I'd be, I, I'd be quite careful uh, with that. Yeah, if I were yeah, you. Uh, uh, the point, could, the point, could I?